Come on, all over the building. Hallelujah. I am free. I am free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. Come on, give God a hand cup of praise. Come on, if you know you're free to worship. Come on, if you know you're free to praise him. I dare you to take a moment and praise him for his goodness and his mercy. And his grace unto us. Come on, the song says freedom. Come on, no more shackles. Come on, we're free to praise him, free to worship him. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, if it's some free people on today. Come on and clap, though. Hey. Come on and clap. Come on and put them together like this. I want to jump a little higher than before.
Come on, worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Take the moment and say thank you, Lord. We just want to thank you. I just want to thank you, Come on and say.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He's been so good to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We must stand to our feet. Hallelujah. I want you to begin to lift your hands and close your eyes as we prepare to wrap up. Hallelujah. Praise and worship. But we want to always make sure we give God what is due his name. And I want you just to begin to think. Hallelujah, about all the things that you can thank him for. I want you to think about all the ways he's made it, not material, hallelujah, but how he's came and seen about you time and time again. And as you think back, I want you to take deep breaths in. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to take those deep breaths in. And then I want you just to begin to say thank you, Jesus, as you think about what he's done. Hallelujah, hallelujah, as you breathe in, hallelujah. God, I thank you for every open door, oh God. God, I thank you for keeping me in my right mind when I was going to throw in the towel. God, I thank you for seeing about my children, oh God. God, I thank you, oh God, when I had questions, Father, that you provided answers that no one else can. Hallelujah. Come on, begin to thank him for yourself. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. Hallelujah. We welcome you to Circle of Hope Family Life Center where Jesus is the center of our circle. We're asking that you greet somebody in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Greet someone in Jesus' name. As I look back over my life, I can see how your love has guided me. Even though I've done wrong, you never left me alone. You forgave me, and you kept on blessing me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of your mercies that we are not consumed. Because thy compassions fail us not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, yeah, yeah. you've been so faithful. As I look back, as I look back over my life, I can see, I can see how your love is guiding me. Even though, even though I've done wrong, you never left me alone. You forgave me and you kept on, and you kept on blessing me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of your mercies that we are not consumed. Because thy compassion fail us not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Come on! 
for tuning in. We thank you for joining us every week. Please feel free to come in on Sunday. We have service. Service starts at 12.30, but we do have Sunday school that starts at 11.30. So we do invite you to come in and fellowship with us on Sundays. Also, as a reminder, we do have prayer call every Monday at 5.30 a.m. and Thursday at 10.30 p.m. If you'd like to get connected, please feel free to call in and pray with us. And on Tuesday, we do have in-person Bible study here at 7 p.m. So we invite you to bring a friend, invite your family member. Please come here in person. And, and also on Wednesdays, our men, they do have their Zoom call with Elder Nehemiah at 8 o'clock p.m. If there's any men online who like to get connected, please reach out to Elder Nehemiah and our teens. Hey, let's just first clap for our Tea Party Saturday. Hey, the girls had a family. Uh, they walked around at home still wearing their pearls and their heads even after. So I'm grateful for what God is doing and with these young women and Sister Kim Campbell for taking the time. Go ahead and just go ahead and clap for her. That was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, they do have their prayer call Wednesday at 845. So please reach out to Sister Kim Campbell to get your team connected. Praise Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise Lord again, everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good for us to be here <clears throat> on this um, Palm Sunday. Amen. And so we bless the Lord for all that he is doing and how he is helping us. And so I told Sister Kimmy she might as well stay it up here. Um, here's what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful that God is helping us raise up ministry. All right, um, ministry that people want to hear. All right, people that you know we don't we don't run away. Who preaching today? And people decide if they want to come or not. All right, um, so God is helping us um, develop graces and and just ministry gifts in the house. And so we thank God for what He is doing. Let's clap our hands for all of those that God is raising up. Bible says if they, they that will be planted in the house of our God, they shall flourish in his courts, okay? And so it's a good thing to be planted. Everyone that's planted, they grow, all right? And so we can testify to that. And so God is faithful. His word is faithful. And so today, amen, on this Palm Sunday, we have our very own, this is uh, her stage name and the stage name, but, you know, we, we nickname her sister kimmy j but she got married now and so we came i, I want to respect her name you know her husband he put her name he put his name on her and so uh, kimmy walter still rings kimmy we just call sister kimmy sister kimmy walter so let's go ahead and clap our hands as she comes and <laughs> with her armor bear her husband <laughs> hey, amen we appreciate them we appreciate her Somebody shout, preach the word. Preach the word. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is faithful. Hallelujah. I thank you for, I thank God for what he's been in my life. Hallelujah, through the course of my life and ever since he filled me with the Holy Ghost about eight years ago. So I'm grateful to God for his hand on my life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, if you guys want to stand for the reading of the word, uh, we will be in Luke 19. start at verse 28 through 48. And I want to read it for context so we can have an understanding of what exactly is going on in this particular time in the Bible, if that's all right. <clears throat> if we have it, say amen. So Luke 19, starting at verse 28. And it says, and then he, ha he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. 
And it came to pass when he was when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you. In the which at this inter in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man asks you, What do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing, loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he came, when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer. Be ye have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. The title of my message for this Sunday afternoon is called, It's Time. It's Time. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for the reading of the word. We thank you, oh God, hallelujah, for just being who you are in our lives, oh Father. God, I pray, oh God, hallelujah, if the word goes forth, oh God, that you allow it to touch every man, every woman, every child in this place, oh Father. May we know of your word and love your word and draw nearer to your word, oh Father. May this word be me to us, O oh God, and may we apply it to our lives, O oh Father. God, we thank you for your word that's still living, that's still changing, that's still reviving, that's still healing, that's still saving, that's still doing a good work in us, O oh Father. And we thank you, God, for being our all in all, God. Have your way in this place on today, O oh God. We give you total access, God, to move how you want to move, O oh God, to do what it is, what you want to do, O oh God, and change whatever it is that you want to change, O oh Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So in this particular part of the scripture, we see that Jesus has come into Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There we go. I said it right. Jerusalem. And this entry signifies the week before his crucifixion and his resurrection. So as Jesus is coming in, he knows what this means as he's coming in. He knows that within a week, he knows that he will be hung on the cross. He had warned his disciples of this day, of this time. He has done many miracles. He has proven himself unto the people that he is the true God, that he is the true Messiah. But yet still people did not believe him. But yet, even though he knew everything that would happen in this final week, Jesus was prepared and had to prepare for his mission, and that was ending on the cross. 
He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Peter would deny him. He knew that many would still reject him, even as each day went by. But yet he chose to still continue on about his father's business. He knew that he would be slandered. He knew that he would be mocked. He knew that he would be lied upon. He knew that he would have to take on all of this in order to die for the sins of humanity. In this particular part of text, we see that Jesus weeped over the city of Jerusalem as he was there. And he weeped because of their spiritual ignorance. He weeped because the city that he knew that he'd done miracles in, the city that should have known who he was, continued to dive into sin. They refused to be obedient. They didn't recognize Jesus as his savior from whether seeing him or from the experiences that they have had with him. And Jesus knew that regardless of what they believed, what they accepted him as, he knew that him dying on the cross would end here. The agony of knowing that even in his return, only a few people will repent, only a few people would accept him, but yet many will still reject him. In spite of Jesus knew the work that he had to do. He knew his mission and he knew the purpose that he had and the purpose was to defeat death. What drew me to this text as I was reading it was the temple. And the temple was meant to be a holy place. It was a place for worship. It was a place where God in heaven can connect where God and earth can connect. It was a place where it was a sacred place. But yet the people had turned this temple into a place of sin where gambling took place, all types of corruption, all types of perversion, all types of sin took place in this temple that was once made just for worship, this holy place. In Matthew 21, you can see that Jesus, when he went to the temple, he cleared the temple out and was throwing tables. He was angry because a lot of sin was taking place in this place that was to be the holies of holies. And even in verse 46 in Luke 19, as we read, it said, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. As I was studying it, even with the temple in mind, it amazed me how what Jesus witnessed when he walked into the temple, how he felt. How can people turn such a holy place into something of sin? How can people be so disrespectful to the Lord our God? How can people destroy something that was so sacred? How can they take advantage of something that was so precious and misuse it for selfish gain? Misuse it for their own lust, for their own desires, for the things they wanted to do. How can they take something so beautiful, so sacred and disrespect? It made me think even though in those days the temple was the building, it was, it was a place of worship, but even to this day, metaphorically, we are the temple of God. And it made me think, how do we disrespect our temples? How we abandon our temples for the lust of the flesh? How we allow our temples that are supposed to be living sacrifices for God be easily corrupted and used for sin. Everybody knew that the temple was holy, but it took something, someone, some form of leadership, somebody to enter in that area and corrupt it. 
And it took other people to follow into that corruption and join into that corruption, knowing what the temple was, knowing what it meant. People chose to follow it, knowing it was sin, knowing it was disrespectful, knowing that's not what God intended that place to be, but yet it was perverted into something that it wasn't supposed to be. See, if we look in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it talks about how we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. It's a familiar part of scripture that we all should know and really take heed to that. Really should memorize and allow it to sit in our spirit. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that ye present, present. Present in this particular part of scripture means prove. It means evidence. So in order for me to be a living sacrifice, I have to prove, I have to prove that this word of God I have to prove that the word that I've heard my whole life, I have to prove that this word that's still living and that when people talk about this good news, I have to prove to myself that this word is good. Therefore, when I prove it to myself, I'm able to be a living sacrifice. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. We are to prove this, this word to ourselves. A lot of times we don't prove the word. We like to hear it. We like to take good parts out of it, but we don't prove it to ourselves. And that's why a lot of us, it's so easy for us to sin because we have not proven the word to us. It's one thing to hear the word, but it's another to be a doer of the word. When you're a doer of the word, that means you're proving yourself to the word. You're proving yourself to be the word. You know this word is evidence in your spirit. Therefore, you're able to go forth and your bodies are able to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God because you've proven this word amongst yourself, which is your reasonable service. But if we go to verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but yet be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove. Prove comes again. Prove in this particular part of text means discern. It means to allow. So once I prove this word, once I make evidence of this word in my life, and I'm convinced of this word in my life, I'm able to be a living sacrifice. And then I'm able to prove, I'm able to discern and allow what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect will of God. I have to prove to myself so then I can discern what is good. We hear this good news. We've seen God miracles, even we've read about his miracles in his word. We've seen it in our lives. We've seen God do miracles. We've overcome by the different testimonies of the people. We've seen God do things even present day. But yet we still won't give ourselves and live the life God sacrificed his son for. We make a mockery of God when we need something. But once God handles it, we recycle God, we reduce what he's done for us until we choose to reuse him again. It's a cycle. We recycle God, we reduce God, we reuse him. But in Galatians 6, chapter 7, and verse 7 and 8, it says, do not be deceived. The word deceived in this particular text means to be in error. Do not be deceived. It means do not go along with the devil. Because the devil is the great deceiver. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And mocked, <laughs> it was crazy. Mocked in this, mock means that whether you agree with the word of God or not, whether your opinion is different from his word, whether you try to twist the word and make it your own, you are wrong. Your opinion doesn't matter because God's word is true. So however you try, God will not be mocked. It means that you cannot change his word. You're wrong however way you try to take his word and use it outside of his word. You're wrong. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that he also reap. 
For he that sowed to his flesh shall reap the, the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sowed to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So we have to be careful about what we sow with among our flesh, what we sow to the spirit. Because like I said, God's word doesn't change. So however you feel about his word, however you may disagree with his word, however you may not want to apply his word, live his word, be true to his word, manipulate his word, you are wrong. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Which temple are you? See, the word defile in this particular text means ruin, destroy, corrupt, false doctrine, evil company. If any man defile the temple of God, the temple, us, the temple of God, him shall God destroy. What evil company are you keeping? What evil company is allowing you to defile your temple? What are you listening to? What are you engaging in? What are you, what are you responding to? What is allowing your temple to be defiled? What false doctrine have you allowed to sit in your spirit to question your relationship with God? How have you defiled your temple? See, we as people are God, we have to make a stand about who we are and which temple are we. Are we going to choose to be the temple of the living God or are we going to choose to be a defiled temple? A defiled temple says that God will destroy because a defiled temple cannot rest with the presence of the God. A defiled temple cannot enter into the holies of holies. A defiled temple cannot enter into heaven. Which temple are ye? Which temple are ye to allow God to dwell with you? Which temple are ye? We can't pick between two options. You either serve God or you serve Baal. We can't continue to be lukewarm and one day I want to serve God, the next I want to serve myself. Which temple are ye? Are we a dwelling temple or a defying temple? We've been dealing a lot with ourselves the past couple weeks. Me traps. Deliver me. Because God is really trying to help us from ourselves. It's ourselves that holds us back from God's will in our lives. It's ourselves. It's our thoughts. We allow ourselves to think a thought and we run on that thought, not knowing whether that thought is of God or is of evil. Because we don't check our thoughts. So we spend our life being confused about our thoughts, which causes us to backslide which causes us to be confused when we know confusion is not of God's. Which temple are ye? Because we have to remember what we feed on has its effects. In the natural, if I choose to eat fast food every day, there will be a side effect. It's the same spiritually. What I feed my spirit will affect me. What I allow my spirit to be entertained with will affect me. If I'm dealing with a particular part of sin and I keep indulging in that sin, it will affect me. I can't be delivered from it if I continue indulging in that same sin that I'm crying every week to be delivered from. What we feed on affects us. So we do have to be mindful because our spirit is very sensitive. We do have to be mindful because what we feed our inner man what we allow to get into our mind and go down to our heart will affect us. It will affect our relationship with God. It will affect how we treat people, how we respond to people, how we deal with things, our emotions. Our emotions have no intellect. So if we're spending our days and our lives just off emotions, we're not allowing God to deal with us. See, what happens is as God is drawing near to us, we withdraw from him. Because we refuse to take accountability. And when we refuse to take accountability, we get into our feelings. And when we get into our feelings, we want to say that it's church hurt. Because we're choosing to not allow God to deal with us. 
We can't call it church hurt if we're not willing to take accountability for how God is trying to change some things in our lives. If God is drawing us near to him, but we keep withdrawing and want to blame it on our feelings and blame it on church hurt, that's not of God. And nor is it God's fault. We tend to keep our mind on what man can do for us, how man can heal us, how man can help us, how man can make us feel good. Instead of relying on God, our creator, who is our healer, who is our helper, who is the way maker, who can do all things. We rely on man to do those things. When we're supposed to rely on God, who can do all things. Because nothing is impossible with him. See, we spend enough time living in the world. world and now it's time for us to live for God. We were born into sin. Sin is what we know. But it's until we get something down on the inside of us, something that can alter our lives, something that can change our whole trajectory of what we life thought was supposed to be like. What we thought life was supposed to be because I grew up in a dysfunctional household or because I settled for abuse, or because I was abused, or because my family battles with alcoholism and depression and all these things. This is all that I know. But it's not until we allow God to deal with us on the inside, that's when true transformation takes place. And when true transfer, tr transfer, tr trans, let, translation takes place, we're able to truly live for God. But we gotta get it down on the inside on the inside of us. True conviction brings change. True conviction brings change, and then that conviction brings action. If we're not truly convicted, there is no change. See, what us as people, what we learn is to manipulate our feelings. My daughter is 11 months. Yes, thank you. She's 11 months. There's a cry when she's hungry. There's a cry when she's sleepy. There's a cry when she has a wet diaper. There's a cry when she wants daddy. There's a cry when she wants mommy. There's a cry when she just wants to be held. There's a cry out for every particular thing. Yet she's a baby. But even us as adults, we grow up and we learn how to manipulate God with our cries. We come to the altar every Sunday and we hear a word and it makes us cry. So we cry it out. We cry out every Sunday because something affected our flesh because it hit our flesh first but it never got past our flesh. It hit our flesh and caused a reaction, which is an emotion that made us cry. But yet we leave, we get in our car, and we're st still battling the same stuff. There was no true conviction. It didn't get past our flesh. It didn't get to the inner lining of our heart. It didn't cause us to have true repentance. It didn't cause us to be truly convicted. It didn't cause us to truly change. We've learned to manipulate our emotions in church. Because crying sounds good. We feel crying convinces the Father, and it does not. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at our hearts. We learn how to manipulate our feelings. But it's not until we truly come to the altar and we truly allow the word of God that's going forth to really convict us and correct us 
to where we're really honest about what's going on and we can able, we be able to cry out and call out those things and truly want deliverance, truly want to be saved, truly want to be healed, truly want God on the inside of us, truly want to live holy, truly want to live righteously, truly want God to order our steps. It's not until we truly want these things, then we can truly come to the altar, truly cry out, truly repent, truly change, truly be convicted, and truly walk with authority. We have to stop manipulating our feelings and playing church because it looks good to cry. It looks good to sound a certain way, to present yourself a certain way, but no, until we truly want God on the inside, you leave here the same every Sunday. We have to be committed to truly wanting to let go of some things, truly wanting to be saved, truly wanting to be healed, truly wanting God to deal with us. I think about how Jesus felt in this final week leading up to his crucifixion. I think about because he, he came as flesh, and dwelt among us. There's no feeling that we can have. There's nothing that we can ever face in this life. There's nothing we can ever go through that Jesus did not feel. Because he bared it all on the cross. So even him weeping for the city, even him, the agony of knowing this is where it's going to end, I got to save humanity. I have to continue on. I can't rebuttal. I can't draw back. I can't have a drawback spirit. I can't pull back from this assignment. Imagine how Jesus felt. Think about it. Think of all the sins you've committed thus far. Before you were saved, just all the sins, just you as an individual. But yet Jesus is taking on that burden for everybody. For ev- not just my sins, but for everybody and for generations to come. He's taking on all of that. So when he's saying in Luke 22 and 42, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. He's crying out, remove this cup from me. He's feeling everything that's about to go down. He's feeling all of this, but yet in his response, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That is the kind of posture we should have. Not my will, Father, but your will be done in me. Not what I want, but God, what you have for me. Not what I need, God, but I want what you feel that I need to have. He's about to endure the cross, but yet he submits to God's will. Imagine just how Jesus felt. Even in a sense of, some parents say they will die for their children. Some spouses say they will die for their spouse. Okay. But even with that, If that was a thing or if that was to happen, even the agony of that, the aftermath, the dealing with that, the healing from that, the trauma from that, we still need Jesus to help us with that. So there's no greater sacrifice than Jesus bearing the cross and dying for us. No matter what other sacrifices other people may do for us, Jesus carried the ultimate sacrifice. And no matter what we face in this life, we need Jesus to help us overcome. We need Jesus to help us navigate. We need Jesus to help regulate our mind and give us wisdom and knowledge. We need Jesus regardless of what's going on. I feel earlier this week I had a, I 
had a remove thy cup from me moment. Um, I was feeling a little overwhelmed. Just all at once. So I decided to go for a drive to clear my head. And, I'm, and we're all human, we have moments. I was having a moment. And I needed to talk to my creator. I needed to be alone and just go somewhere and just talk to my creator. I was having a moment. And as I'm crying out and as I'm praying to God and, and just praying and just asking him all different things and this, that, and the other, God spoke to me so clearly. And he said, stop limiting yourself when you serve a God that's unlimited. Stop, stop limiting yourself when you serve a God that's unlimited. Because in this fill my cup moment, I was feeling defeated. I was feeling overwhelmed. I was feeling like it was too much going on all at one time. So I was limiting myself and my ability. But what God gives, he gives us the grace to go through. What he gives, he helps us and has an expected end for whatever we have going on. But in that moment, I was feeling the pressure and the overwhelming of all these different things going on. And I started to limit myself. And God said, stop limiting yourself when you have an unlimited God. And I thank God for his word because it quickened me. It quickened me to know that God, he's a God of all possibilities. Even when I feel inadequate, even when the pressures of life try to consume me, I can still go forth because he is an unlimited God. Nothing ends with him. He holds all power, everything in his hands. So he got me. Just like he has all of us. So we need to stop limiting God and limiting his authority and limiting what he wants to do in our life. If Jesus died for us on the cross, if Jesus paid this ultimate sacrifice, it's disrespectful for us to continue to live in sin and continue to not abide by the rules and the regulations and live in holiness as God has told us to live. It's disrespectful of us to continue to go back and we got to things that God has saved us from. It's disrespectful of us to continue to play church, play God, continue to continue to allow our, our minds to not be renewed, not be restored, not be revived. It's disrespectful to God that we are not following his will and his way. I love that this morning during power hour, Lady Valerie was led to do a rapture drill because it's time for us as the people of God to stop playing God. The right, we need to be ready whenever he comes. We don't know the time. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We don't know when he's coming, but yet that rapture drill every time that we do it when we randomly do it should quicken us because we should be ready and if we're not ready we need to get ready we need to make sure that we're ready we need to be like God I want to be ready when you come we don't have years we don't have decades we don't know when he's coming and then if you're unsure if you're ready then you need it's time to get ready Jesus knew it was time for him to die for us on the cross he knew he had to do that. It was time. Therefore, it's time for us to live as a living sacrifice because he paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. It's time for us to put away some things. It's time for us to stop playing God. Help us, Holy Ghost. I remember before I met my husband, not met my husband, but before we courted, I spent four years of singleness. Single mother, three kids, four years of singleness, meaning I did not entertain any conversations. I did not date anybody. It was God, me, my children, and anybody else that fit in that bubble. 
but I made a decision that it was time for me to allow God to deal with me. I made a decision that I wanted God to be the head of my life. I made a decision that I wanted to walk in order and I wanted God to heal me from different traumas that I ignored my whole life. I heard of God my whole life. I heard of him dying for me, his blood that was shed for me, how he sacrificed himself for me, gave himself for me. But yet my whole life I was choosing to do things my own way. And it wasn't until I allowed God to begin to deal with me that he began to convict me and correct me. During those four years of singleness, I was extremely content with Jesus. Extremely content. Meaning, if it wasn't from God, I didn't want it. No matter what it was. Because I learned of this love of Jesus dying for me on the cross. I learned that this love, there's no greater love than this love of God. And I allowed that love to get inside of me. I allowed that love to restore me and to renew me. I allowed that love to change my whole thought process. I allowed that love to restore me. I never felt so high in my life on the love of God. And because I allowed the word of God to help me, to heal me, a lot of times we want to blame everybody else for our issues instead of looking at ourselves. And in the season of singleness, I had to deal with myself. Why did I accept X, Y, and Z? Why did I allow this to happen to me? Why did I entertain X, Y, and Z. But I learned during that single of season, singleness that God is a true God and that there's nothing that he cannot heal. And I thank God for the cross because one of the first things that I remember diving into was the cross. The first thing I remember diving into in the season of singleness um, as I'm allowing God to deal with me was what happened on the cross and how this ultimate sacrifice was done for me. Little old me, God, you died for me so that I can be free from this depression that I'm going through and from this anxiety that I'm going through and from this childhood trauma that I'm facing and from all these things that are happening in my life. God, you allowed that to happen so that I can be free. And I'm grateful to God that he allowed me to know of his love for him, knowing this love of him sending his son to die on the cross for me. This love, because now that I know of this love, nothing can change my mind. Nothing can turn me a different way. Nothing can turn me to another religion. Nobody can talk any disrespectfulness about my God. Can nobody say anything about God? Because I know of his love for me. He's made his love true for me by dying for me. Therefore, I am convinced and I've proven to myself that this love, there's no greater love. And if we was to allow the love of God to really get into the depths of our soul, if we was to really allow the love of God to really meditate on our mind, if we was to really allow the the love of God to really settle within us. We will be free from all these things that we continue to battle that Jesus had died for us for. If we allow that love to really, if we actually confess those things, sometimes you got to call out some things. You can't just have a muzzled mouth when it comes to your healing. The woman with the issue of blood, she was desperate. She went through a crowd seeking Jesus. She was desperate until she touched him and was healed. We have to learn how to be desperate for our freedom. We have to learn how to be desperate for our healing. We have to learn to be desperate to allow God to live for us and in us and to direct us and order our steps. We have to have that fight. And it's not until we have that fight and want to put away some things, it would never happen for us. No matter how much we cry out, 
it won't happen for us because we are not fully turning and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, accepting what he did on the cross for us, accepting that now is the time for us to really take heed of who God is in our lives. We have to stop playing God. And we have to be serious about our salvation because our salvation is what brings us peace. It's our salvation that what helps us get through when we're going through grief, when we're going through all different types of things. It's our salvation that sustains us. And we're all capable of having this sense of freedom if only we would be honest with ourselves. The me traps, the things that withhold us from God, the things that hold us back from giving God our all. What are those things? What are those things that are keeping us from carrying our cross? What are those things that are allowing us to not accept who God is in our lives and what he wants to do for us? What are those things? How long are we going to keep playing around with these things? Because when God comes, I don't want him to say, depart from me. Because I allow these thoughts of doubt, the secret sin that I'm in, the perversion that I'm in, the lies that I tell, the sins that I continue to run rapid in my life to continuously live in my life. I want to be restored. I want to be whole. I want to allow God to deal with me, to deal with my heart issues. I want to allow him to regulate my thoughts. I want to focus on all things that are him, that are pure, that are acceptable. I want his promises to reign in my life. But it's not until we come to the realization that it's time for us to let go and let God. To let go and let God. If we can all stand to our feet. I want us to get our mind on Jesus and the cross. Because if we don't fully understand the teaching of the text that was read or why Jesus died for us and what Resurrection Sunday means, then we'll come in here next week and every Sunday after that, still stuck in the same place over and over again. We'll continue to live a life of bondage. A lot of us remain in sin because we refuse to give God a sacrifice. Jesus became the sacrifice for us. What are we willing to give God? What are we willing to give God so that we can be free? What are we willing to give God so that he can heal us? What are we willing to live God so that we can walk in full purpose and full authority? What are we willing to give God? What is it that is holding us back? What is it that is blocking God from doing a mighty work in us? What heaviness have we opened the door to? What stronghold is still holding us captive? What is it? What is it? It's not until we recognize these things and be honest about these things that God can actually do the work in us to heal us. We're called to be living sacrifices for him. But we can't be a hypocrite. We can't continue to do things contrary to his word and feel that we're living our best life. 
we have to be honest with the things that are keeping us bondage. I had to be honest with my mind battles. With feeling inadequate about things. I had to be honest about that. I had to be honest about childhood trauma that has allowed me to dip and dive in things that I shouldn't have to. I had to be honest about that. But God, he's a gentleman. So you can cast your cares onto him and he's a gentleman with your cares. He will pour his love into you and it's okay. You don't have to feel ashamed of what has transpired or how you're feeling because he's a gentleman. He deals with the broken hearts. He will help us. He will help us. Because Jesus died for us, what sacrifice are we willing to give to him? Everybody, hands lifted. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, oh God, for being a loving God. Hallelujah, Jesus. That you loved us so much, God, that you sent your begotten son to die for us, oh, Father. That you loved us so much, oh, God, that you didn't want us, God, to be in bondage or be trapped, oh, God, or deal with the heaviness and the weights of life, oh, God. We thank you, God, hallelujah, that you love us that much, oh, God, that we're not meant, God, to carry these weights, oh, Father. But yet we're meant to be free, oh, God. For your word says, who the son set free is free indeed, oh, Father. So, God, I pray, God, that every man, every woman, every child in this place, oh, God, that they come out of agreement, oh, God, with things, God, that are holding them bondage, oh, Father. God, I pray, God, hallelujah, that every man, every woman, every child in this place, oh, God, know that it's okay to cast their cares onto you, willingly cast their cares onto you, oh, Father. And really want to be changed, want your healing, want your salvation, want to be made free, oh God, want to be made whole, oh God, want to walk in with a right and sound mind, oh Father, want to walk in peace, oh God, hallelujah, Jesus. That we know, God, that we, that we no longer have to be bound, oh Father, by the different traps, God, and the ways of this world, oh God. Hallelujah. But we can be made free right now, oh God. Hallelujah. It's time for us, oh Father. Hallelujah. To come out of bondage, oh God. It's time for us, oh Father. Hallelujah. To come out of agreement, God, with things that cause us to sin, oh Father. It's time for us, oh God, to be serious about your ways. It's time for us to be serious about your word, oh God. It's time for us, God, to be holy because you are holy, oh God. It's time for us to walk in a righteousness, oh God. It's time for us, oh God, to give ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, oh God. Hallelujah. We are here today, oh God. Give it ourselves to you, oh God. Give it ourselves to you, oh Father. We want your will, your way, oh God, to work in us, oh God. Hallelujah. We want to move out of the way, God, so that you can have your way within us, oh God. We no longer want to think our own way or do our own thing, oh God, or allow the thoughts of our own, oh God, to control us, oh God. Hallelujah. But we want your will, your way, oh God, to live within us, oh God. Order our steps, oh Father. Help us right now, oh God. Hallelujah. For it's us, oh God, standing in the need of prayer, oh Father. It's us standing in the need of you, oh God. It's us standing wanting a touch from you, oh God. A feel from you, oh God. It's us right now needing you, oh Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come into our midst, oh Father. Help your people to know that it's okay, oh God. Hallelujah, to sacrifice for you, oh God. Because your son sacrificed for us, oh God. Help us, oh God, to not leave the same way that we came in this house on today, oh God. That we leave, oh God, every bondage, oh God, every secret sin, oh God, every sin, oh God, every mind battle, every struggle, every test, every trial, oh Father. That
that we leave it at the altar on today, oh God. Hallelujah. And when we leave, we don't pick it back up, oh Father. Because we allow your word, God, to work in us and to live in us, oh Father. So that we can walk in full power and authority, oh God. Because we know that you are making things good for us, oh God. That you're going to turn everything around for us, oh God. If only we believed your word, oh Father. Help us, oh God, not just to be hearers, but doers of your word, oh Father. Help us, oh God, how we to know, God, that true conviction brings change, oh Father. Help us, God, to know, God, hallelujah, that you are with us, oh God, no matter what we are going through, oh Father. There's nothing too hard for you. There's no feeling that we have. There's no shame, no guilt, oh God, that we may have experienced in life, oh God, that is too big for you, oh God. Help us, oh God, to stop limiting you, God. Because you are an unlimited God. You are a God of all possibilities, oh God. You are a God of all power, oh God. Help us, God, to know we no longer have to battle it alone, oh God. We no longer have to fight it alone, oh God. We no longer have to deal with it in secret, oh Father. But God, today, we can give it to you, oh God. We can cast that onto you, oh God. Because it's not our burden to bear. It's not our burden to carry, oh God. Help us right now, oh God, to know, God, that you are capable, that you are able, God, to do all things, oh God. There's nothing impossible for you, oh God. Help us, oh God, to believe, oh God, this word that saves, to believe this word that heals, to believe this miracle-working word, oh Father, to believe, oh God, and know, God, that your word is true, oh God, to not change your word to fit ourselves in our own way, oh God, but to be obedient and willing to your word, oh God, to abide by your word, oh God, to live by your word, oh God, to live by your instruction, to live by your authority, oh God, to live in order and allow you to order our steps oh God. God, we need you, oh God. We need you, oh Father. For we are nothing without you, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, deal with the issues of our hearts, oh Father. Deal with the battles in our mind, oh God. May everything that's not of you, oh God, be loose right now in the name of Jesus. May every struggle, oh God, may every thought of confusion and insecurity, oh God, be loosed right now in the name of Jesus. Oh God, may everything, God, that doesn't compare to your word or is not in your word be loosed in the name of Jesus. Help us, oh God, to study, to show ourselves approval, oh God, to know what your word requires of us, oh God, and allow your word, oh God, to live in us, oh God. God, we need you, oh God. God, we need your help, oh God, because we are nothing without you, oh Father. Help us right now, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, heal us right now, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, deal with us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Do what you want to do. Help how you want to help. Change what you want to change, oh God. Restore whatever it needs that you need to restore, oh God. Hallelujah. Align us, oh God, with your will and your way, oh God. Hallelujah. It's time for us, God, to walk in accordingly, oh God, to who you have called us to be, oh God, accordingly to your purpose, oh God. Help us right now, oh God. Oh God. That we not be succumbed to the peer pressures of life, oh God. To the peer pressures of this world, oh God. To this culture, oh God. But we stand ten toes down, oh God. On your word, oh God. That we stand ten toes down, oh God. On this firm foundation, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Help us, God. Help us, God, to know that we are not alone, oh God. No matter what we face, oh God. That you conquered sin, that you conquered death, that you conquered the grave for us, oh God. Therefore, there's nothing that we can face and go through, God, that you will not see us through. Help us, oh God. Help us, Holy Ghost. Help us, Holy Ghost. God, we thank you, oh God. We thank you, God, for what you're doing even right now, oh Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, hallelujah, for how you're dealing with us right now, oh God. God, we want to be used for your glory. We want your glory to reign in our lives, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh God, help us, oh God, to be 
living examples, God, of your word, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh God, help us, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. That we live by your word, oh God, and be obedient to your ways, oh Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
as we prepare to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. You don't want to go into this holy week bound. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's warned us that he's coming back. Hallelujah. We celebrated the, the fact that we're free, but it, if I could be honest, some of us are still bound trying to celebrate the fact that we're free. We know that we go through the week, like Sister Kim said, she had to take a, a moment, and I love that, a remove thy cup moment. Hallelujah, because she felt so overwhelmed. But then we gather in the house to celebrate the fact that we're free. We're not totally free until we're totally free. And if you, you're still feeling bound, he's extending the altar call. Hallelujah. He's extending the altar call. And yes, for some of us this Holy Week, it must look different. It's going to require more of a sacrifice. I'm sure a pastor will send out church-wide requirements, but you're going to have to make up in your mind. How do I make this Holy Week? mean what it's set for. It's not about the Easter bunny. It's not about finding the eggs. Hallelujah. It's about Christ who rose from the dead so that we would have new life. And he's given us the opportunity to walk in new life again. And yes, some of us, we've tried over and over again and we failed. But guess what? As long as there's still breath in your body, hallelujah, he's able to make you new. And I hear him saying, just try me again. Hallelujah. Just try me again. Just, just try me again. Hallelujah. Let me make you and mold you into what I want you to be. Stop dropping the weights and then going to pick them back up. You can drop and leave them. Hallelujah. For some, it's, not, it's time to return back to our first love. Hallelujah. For some, we, we haven't had a refilling in a while. Hallelujah. We're going through the motions of praying, but we ain't felt nothing. We come out of our prayer rooms just as dry as we went in. But we're here today. Not knowing what the week may hold, but knowing that God is able. She said he's a limitless God. He's a limitless God. Stop holding back putting limits on God because he is limitless. What we think is heavy for him is light. It says his burdens are light. His yoke is easy. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, there's souls at the altar. Hallelujah. We should remember that day, hallelujah, where we needed him to touch us. Oh God, in your name, Jesus. It's in your name, Jesus. In your name, Jesus. It's in your name, Jesus. And before we end, hallelujah. I want y'all to look around. Hallelujah. Pastor preached a series a while ago. No more empty seats. Hallelujah. But in order for the seats to be filled, we got to be doing what God has called us to do. We have to go there for hallelujah. We got to go after people. So as we pray this last prayer before we collect our offering, I want you to get somebody on your mind. Somebody this week you're going to go fishing for. God, when I pray, God, when I fast, I'm going on behalf of this individual. Yeah, I know. You got your own stuff. We all do. 
But this holy we sacrifice, let it be different. There's no greater way to celebrate the resurrection than to have souls going down in Jesus' name, to have people filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what we want to happen. Hallelujah. So we're going to pray right now for that individual that's on your mind. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we know that you are omnipotent, God. God, that you have all power, oh Father. And God, as we close this altar call, oh God, God, we're coming to you on behalf of our loved one, oh God. God, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, God, you know the name that is spoken at every seat, Father. God, we're asking as we go through this week, God, as we reach out to them, as we pray for them, God, as we dedicate our fast time to them, oh God, God, that you will bring them to the house, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, and that when they come, God, you will begin to break up the fallow ground of their heart, God. God, that the word that is spoken will fall on good ground, God. God, that we'll celebrate your resurrection day, God. Oh, God, celebrating others that are beginning to walk in the new life, oh, God. God, the life that you died, oh, God, that you were crucified for, God, that you shed your blood for, God. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Open their ears, God. Open their eyes, God, and give us the word, oh, God, to reach you. And God, we thank you, and we praise you, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, as Deacon Josh comes, if we would begin to prepare our offerings, hallelujah, it is Fourth Sunday, those of us who have our building fund pledges, please make sure that you bring those during this time as well, there's a special envelope, some of us give online and have already sewn. If you want to bring your offering, amen, at this time, hallelujah.